Hey, Dog Nation. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented today by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort. A lot to do on today's program. The coaches poll is out. I believe that gives us a couple of clues as to what we can expect from Georgia this season. It also kind of reminds us of why some people may have said what they've said about the dogs here over the course of the last couple of weeks. We'll talk more about that here in just a moment. We'll hear a little bit from Dan Lanning, very revealing press conference from him yesterday. We'll do a lot of this over the days to come, but some of that here today. Our buddy Mike Griffith stops by. He gives us a little bit of an update on UGA practices. There's some recruiting news to get to. Five-star defensive tackle Travis Shaw now knows his commitment date. We'll talk about that, and we'll just kind of generally speaking Try to have a good time and keep you up to date on everything happening around both the dogs and the rest of college football. It is great to have you with us as Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented today by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Harris Cherokee Resort. Find us online at Caesars.com slash Harris dash Cherokee. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. This time of year, there were a lot of signals that were getting closer to the start of the college football season. Another one of those came yesterday when the coaches poll was released. There's two main polls, as you know. There's the Associated Press poll, which will come out in a a couple of, uh, sometime in the very near future. I'm not sure. 100% sure when that comes out Uh, but the coaches poll came out yesterday and I think there's a little bit of a misnomer out there about some of these preseason polls we have been conditioned to believe the preseason polls don't matter at all because it's been a fairly popular refrain to say the polls shouldn't even come out until October it's ridiculous to rank these teams uh, before the season even takes place that's actually kind of existed as a fairly common thought amongst folks in college football for quite some time but the truth is the preseason polls are actually a little bit more predictive than you might imagine and certainly far more predictive than other preseason predictions that are out there let me give you a little bit of a comparison and then we'll kind of dive into this year's poll and maybe what it says about Georgia in 2019 LSU won the national championship however at that year's SEC media days when the official SEC order of finish was voted on and released by the SEC media who was there in the building for that event. Only three people in the entire SEC media contingent actually picked LSU to even win the SEC when they actually went on to win the national championship and was a historically good team in the process. So not every preseason prediction is completely accurate. However, the preseason polls, and I I, I kind of attribute this sometimes to the wisdom of crowds. Sometimes large groups of people are really, really wrong. But sometimes when you survey a large group of people, you get something that's on balance a little more correct than maybe a smaller sample or just one guy's opinion or whatever else. So to kind of back up here for a moment why the preseason polls themselves are actually a little bit more predictive than you might think. Let me give you a couple of numbers here. If you go back and look at the last five years of the college football playoff, The team ranked number one in the preseason coaches poll has made the college football playoff, at least made the playoff in all five of those years. In other words, this isn't a wildly incorrect prediction because being preseason number one has at least been good enough to punch a ticket to the college football playoff. The number two team in the preseason rankings has gone on to make the college football playoff in three of the last five years. Once again, more often than not, the number two team preseason was at least a playoff team. Same thing for number three there as well. The number three team in the preseason coaches poll has gone on to make the college football playoff three times in the last five years. I'd say overall that's a pretty good batting average. Now, I'll get into some more of these numbers here in just a moment, but that's at least a little bit of a of a reminder that, hey, these polls aren't wildly wrong in terms of what the end of the season looks like. They may not nail the national champion perfectly, but in terms of that of that population of the four teams that make the college football playoff, at the start of the season, the folks who vote on the preseason coaches poll seem to generally speaking, have a pretty good idea of all of that. So with that in mind, here is the preseason coaches poll for this upcoming season for 2021. Georgia, as you may be aware of now, comes at number five on that list. Ahead of them in order, Alabama at one, Clemson at two, Oklahoma at three, Ohio State at four. Those are the teams ranked ahead, as I said, of Georgia there at five. So obviously Georgia starts the upcoming year in about as close a group as you can be for teams that have a chance to make the college football playoff for the upcoming season. That's a good place to be. And ironically, 
Where Georgia is at five, now you can decide for yourself if this means anything or not. I'm not necessarily sure if it does, but it's at least interesting. Where Georgia starts off at five might actually be a better spot to be than the two teams, uh, Oklahoma and Ohio State, who are rated ahead of it. Because this is kind of the weird thing that has kind of played out over the course of the last five years. That if you look at the com- the combined efforts of the number three team and the number four team from the preseason coaches poll, they've actually gonna only made the playoffs a total of four times over the last five seasons. The the I'm so, or sorry, a total of three times over the last five seasons. The number four seeds made the playoff just one time. I should say the preseason number four team has made the playoff just once in the last five years. The preseason uh, number three team has made it three times. So it was four times. I had that correct. Let me try to. <laughs> Sorry, that was a little bit confusing. I was looking at the wrong numbers on that. But the point is, the number five, uh, the preseason number five teams made the playoff twice in the last five years, and teams ranked uh, lower than five, or, or, or you know, after the number five spot, six and beyond, they've actually made the playoff four times over the last five years. So what you kind of see here to kind of sum sum this part of it up is. You see one preseason number one, preseason number two, preseason number three making the college football playoff with regularity. And then after that, there is typically speaking a a party crasher in the group, whether it's, you know, Washington, uh, you know, Michigan State going back to maybe 2016 or, you know, maybe Georgia might have been that uh, uh, party crasher for 2017 or you could, you know, Notre Dame may have been that party crasher for 2018. That's basically the makeup of the college football playoff over the course of the last few years. About two or three teams that you could have rubber stamped at the beginning of the year to make the college football playoff and then one team kind of from that lower-ranked group, LSU won the national championship in 2019 as the preseason number six team, some team from kind of outside that top three preseason ranking that goes on to crash that 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 spot there in the college football playoff. That's kind of the makeup of, of all of this. So obviously Georgia, where it sits as a preseason number five, would be one of those teams that, you know, that, that kind of has a, a good shot at doing this. However, however, while that's the positive assessment – of all this related to UGA, there is at least a a negative assessment on this related to UGA that I think we at least have to spend some time addressing because what the recent history of the preseason coaches poll, which came out yesterday, what the recent history of that preseason coaches poll shows you is that at least one argument that's been out there for the negative about Georgia There is at least some evidence to back that up. And I don't take great pleasure in saying this. Obviously, I'm a Georgia fan. I'd like for this not to be true. But this is one of those things that you do have to acknowledge. We talked about this with Connor Riley yesterday. There was a story at ESPN.com this week about Georgia being this, you know, historic underachieving program. And Adam Rittenberg, the writer for ESPN, you can read more about this at DogNation.com, but Adam Rittenberg, the writer for ESPN, basically saying that Georgia was almost in a category by itself over the course of the last couple of decades in terms of programs that have just kind of underachieved in relationship to the expectations. I don't like hearing that. I don't like even talking about that, but that is what's out there. Unfortunately, this is also the cloud that Georgia kind of has hanging over a little bit as it begins this upcoming season related to the preseason coaches poll. Because if you go back and look, since 2017, when Georgia started that season 15th in the coaches poll and actually made the college football playoff, finished second in the country, in the three years since, Georgia's actually finished at the end of the season worse than they started the year in the preseason coaches poll fourth to begin the season in 2018 according to the preseason coaches rankings but just ninth at the end of the season third to begin the season in the 2019 preseason coaches poll but fourth at the end of the season close but still but still worse 2020 georgia starts preseason number four in the coaches poll finishes the season at number seven that's three straight years unfortunately for georgia where its end of the season rank was worse than its preseason rank at least on the basis of the coach poll which I do think puts a little bit of pressure I mean you just have to acknowledge it right I do think that puts a little bit of pressure on Georgia for the upcoming season we've heard it said hey it's championship or bust this year for UGA and every time a prominent voice has said that about the dogs we've come on this show and say no I'm not quite so sure it's truly championship or bust and I stand by that opinion I don't think that this is Georgia's last chance to win a national championship but if you change the wording of that hot take and went away from the notion of it being championship or bust, all of a sudden now maybe it's make college football playoff or bust. 
now I'm a little bit more willing to listen to that discussion, especially given the fact that the last three years for Georgia have seen end-of-season results that were worse than they were projected to be in the preseason. I can kind of listen to somebody who wants to say it is very important this year for Georgia to make the college football playoff, or said slightly a different way. It is very important for Georgia to have an end-of-season result this year that feels different than the last three years of end-of-season results have felt, where Georgia's been about second-best team in the SEC, or at least very close to that, and like like fifth best in the country, sixth best in the country, something like that, just on the outside looking in of the college football playoff. I would say that this year, if you want to tell me that Georgia needs to have a season that resembles a lot more like what 2017 was, even if it stops short of a national championship, that's a conversation I'm you know somewhat willing to have. And I think it puts a spotlight on just how important that Clemson game is for UGA because obviously the the caveat to the preseason number one and preseason number two teams making the college football playoff so much is the fact that over the course of the last five years, those two teams have frequently been Alabama and Clemson. Now, we know about the side-by-side comparison between Georgia and Alabama. Dogs have been close to beating Alabama and have just not quite been able to do it. Heartbreaker in the 2017 National Championship game, heartbreaker in the 2018 SEC Championship game, and then uh, let the game slip away in the second half last Last year in Tuscaloosa. We know what the measuring stick for Georgia against Alabama has been, and that's been the biggest thorn in Kirby Smart and the rest of Dog Nation side since Smart has kind of got this Georgia program up and running since 2017. However, the other team that's kind of in that top two each and every year that always seems to be able to punch its ticket to the college football playoff, we haven't seen the on field comparison yet between Georgia and Clemson. And it is quite possibly that Clemson, who does not play year in, year out, week in, week out, the same level of schedule that Georgia does or or Alabama does, that they have taken advantage of an ACC that, let's face it, is much weaker. Right now, Georgia's the only preseason ranked team on Clemson's schedule, according to the coaches poll that came out yesterday. We have not seen Georgia get the chance to use a program like Clemson as its measuring stick. So that's why week one matters for the dogs against the Tigers. A chance to start a playoff resume before you even get to the SEC championship and a possible matchup against Alabama. Which is not to say that I or any other UGA fan would concede the game against the Crimson Tide if it takes place, but it's just an acknowledgement of what is obviously facing Georgia this season. Consecutive year after year after year, end of season results that seem to somewhat replicate themselves, with Georgia fans feeling frustrated about having to watch the college football playoff on TV. It'd be great to say that Georgia can steamroll Alabama as a way of changing that this year. Maybe that happens. But this Clemson game for the dogs, the beginning of this upcoming season, is an incredible gift. It's a chance to take what starts off as a preseason number five and puts it on a track to potentially be much better than that when the 2021 season comes to an end. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort, and great to have you with us, no matter how you get to us today, live on video, 10 a.m., Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, right there on the page of dognation.com. Boy, I've heard great feedback about that. So many people enjoying the chance to just go to dognation.com, right there above the fold at the top of the page, watching the show on video each and every day. Thousands of you have now made that your choice for watching us on video, and that's a really cool thing to be able to enjoy, especially given the fact that I mean, 90-something percent of the people who watch the show actually watch it after it airs live. The fact that so many of you are now watching live right there at dognation.com is a uh, is a really cool thing. So thank you so much for doing that, and we appreciate you being a part of the program today. Of course, radio and podcast, we still love you as well. Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref, all the various podcast platforms, and our friends at Harris Cherokee Casino Resort that makes all this possible. Told you before, football season is coming quickly, but there is still time for you to take a great summer getaway as a way of either celebrating the start of the season or just enjoying a little bit more of what's going on in the uh, summer. And no better getaway than my friends at Harris Cherokee Casino Resort. Just a two-hour drive from where I'm sitting here right now will get you to the original Harris Cherokee Casino Resort property or Harris Cherokee Valley River. By the way, with football coming up, also fun to think about the fact that the, the book is now open there as well. Sports gaming in the mountains of western North Carolina. You can place your wagers, your futures picks for the upcoming season, your week one odds are posted there as well. Go ahead and get your football bets down right there in North Carolina at the Harris Cherokee Casino Resort Properties. Really fun stuff to do, of course, the regular table games and the dining, the spa, and everything else there as well. Wonderful golf at Sequoia National. Just go to this website. You can learn everything you need to know. It's Caesars.com slash Harris-Cherokee. 
That's Caesars.com slash Harris-Cherokee. That'll get you in touch with Harris Cherokee Casino Resort, and you can plan a great getaway, just a two-hour drive from where I'm sitting right here in the city of Atlanta. All right, coming up in just a moment, we'll get a very fun update from Mike Griffith here. We'll get a practice report update from him brought to you by our friends at georgia farm bureau that's going to be a lot of fun here coming up in just a moment before that though i do want to go around the doghouse here today and we'll do some of this today and a lot more of this in the days to come because i thought that georgia defensive coordinator dan lanning had a very revealing press conference yesterday talking about his outlook for his defense for the upcoming season and obviously any kind of discussion like that begins with the recent coaching changes that have taken place at georgia special teams coach scott cochran stepping away for now stepping in for him in the special teams role is of course former south carolina and florida head coach will muschamp but muschamp with that defensive pedigree that he brings to the table is also someone that lanning was open and honest to say that yes he also views him as an asset for that defensive game planning as well this is interesting Interesting stuff from the Georgia defensive coordinator. Take a listen to that. Really a blessing for us to have that uh, that experience on, on our side of the ball. And um, the great thing about our group is there's zero egos. Uh, and a lot of guys are – everybody's pulling the rope in the same direction. And uh, when you can have a guy like Coach Muschamp, uh, as well as the additional coaches we have on our staff, it's obviously a benefit for myself and every one of our players. That is not necessarily an easy thing for a young coach to say because, let's face it, for Dan Lanning, obviously he has professional ambitions. He wants to be a head coach. And one of the things that – and this is just human nature. You assume this is true. One of the things that Lanning really deals with is the challenge of, well, is it really Dan Lanning's defense or is it the defensive-minded Kirby Smart who's actually the architect of whatever for the good or the bad George is doing defensively? How much credit does Dan Lanning really get for all of this? You can certainly have heard people say that before, and you can assume that people are maybe even saying that to Dan Lanning in job interviews if he's going to try to be a head coach, something like that, of how much can you really control a defense when Kirby Smart's your head coach? That's just a fact that Lanning probably deals with that. Even if it's not true, it's the, it's the narrative that exists around Lanning. So all of a sudden now, another name is in the mix. A guy like Muschamp, who also has been a credentialed defensive mind, and yet Lanning, to his credit, says, I'm not worried about that at all. There's no ego on my part or the part of any of the other Georgia coaches. We welcome Will Muschamp's influence on the Georgia defense. And that is kind of an uncommon thing for coaches to think, coaches to say, because they all have professional ambitions. Lanning is no different on that. And it certainly seems like, based on what Lanning said there, that he's taking much the same way you ask Georgia players to take a team-first attitude. It sounds like Lanning's kind of taking his own version of a team-first attitude on that, which I think is kind of interesting. However, as far as those professional ambitions, the fact that Lanning's name briefly surfaced as a potential replacement for Les Miles as head coach at Kansas, certainly more officially he was thought to be in the mix to be Steve Sarkeesian's defensive coordinator at Texas. We kind of know that Lanning turned that one down because Lanning made a big show on Twitter about the fact that he was all in and ready to run it back for the dogs in 2021. Either way, Lanning's name was connected to some high-profile job openings here this past offseason, but that shouldn't be taken to mean that Lanning's in any big hurry to go anywhere more from him yesterday on that topic. Well, first off, I just got to say that I'm forever grateful to Coach Smart for giving me the opportunity to coach um, at the University of Georgia. You know, it's 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 always been a dream of mine to coach the elite and have an opportunity to compete for championships at the highest level. And I think Georgia provides that. And, um, you know, they've always been competitive. And when you have good programs, guys are going to get opportunities. Um, but the grass is certainly not always greener. And, you know, I learned that from watching Coach Smart for several years, you know, uh, being where you're at and being successful where you're at, you know, those opportunities will come. But but my focus is being here right now. In the case of the Kansas opening, I do think Kansas was very interested in bringing in a current head coach, someone who had head coaching experience. So maybe Lanning wasn't quite ready for that one as of yet on the basis of the way that the Kansas folks seemingly talked about that. But the notion that he could have left for big bucks to go help Steve Sarkeesian start his program at Texas, I think that very was a real consideration. And I've said many times before, the fact that Lanning didn't do that, the fact that George was able to seemingly pony up financially and keep Lanning employed here at UGA, I think was one of the bigger stories of the offseason. And I think yesterday's press conference conference is one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to playing you more of this press conference over the course of the days to come. I think the the, the press conference yesterday is a really pretty good indication of why holding on to landing this year was such a big thing for Georgia. There were so many moments yesterday, asks specifically about Trayvon Walker, 
asks specifically about Nolan Smith. So many times yesterday when Lanning was asked specifically about Georgia players, especially those Georgia players who play in the front seven, and Lanning took that moment to pivot the conversation towards tackles for loss and sacks, impactful, as though as we've used this word before, havoc plays that great defenses seem to be able to do, especially against good offenses. Great defenses seem to be able to make those impactful negative plays. Georgia did a lot more of that a year ago, and some of that was because of the individual success of a guy like Aziz Ojolari. But also, I truly believe a lot of that was attributed to the fact that that's what Dan Lanning's coaching personality seems to be. Lanning seems to be really interested in generating pass rush and activity in the backfield, havoc plays. He seems fully committed to that. And while, yet, yes, last year, maybe statistically speaking, wasn't quite as good as Georgia fans would have liked for it to be, the pass defense had some issues against Florida and Alabama and things like that, in terms of the, the way in which the defensive identity of Georgia evolved, I think that was a big step forward. I think that Georgia, by the way that it played last year, even if the results weren't always perfect, the way that it played last year, I think makes Georgia look a lot like the kind of team that truly can compete at the highest level in 2021 and perhaps beyond. So one of these days, Dan Lanning is likely to be a head coach. But for now, that's not the case. And the impact that he's making on the Georgia uh, defense, I truly believe is profound as Georgia looks to replace guys like Aziz Ojolari and continue the momentum this season that it enjoyed last year in terms of a much more effective pass rush, the best pass rushing season of the Kirby Smart era. I think a guy like Dan Lanning is an important figure in that entire conversation. That is Around the Doghouse. It's great to have you here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort here today. We have got a very important recruiting update before we're done. Five-star defensive lineman Travis Shaw has made a significant announcement. We'll talk about that, where things seemingly stand between the dogs and Shaw. That is all coming up. But for now, on everything happening with UGA practice and everything happening around those practices with the program as the upcoming season gets, uh, gets ready to begin, let's get a Georgia Farm Bureau practice report with our buddy Mike Griffith here on Dog Nation Daily. And we will get Mike Griffith here coming up in just a moment. Hopefully that's not a phone issue. Hopefully he's just, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're good to go on that. So we're getting Mike squared away. Have no fear. There's no, 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 no technical issue. Just Mike not quite ready to uh, go as of yet. So we'll get him uh, up and running here in a moment. See, this is what I get for starting on time. We've, we are very, very intentional about trying to start the show more on time. And so when I start the show on time, everything else kind of moves on a little quicker there too. So we kind of drew Mike uh, off sides there, a little bit of a false start for him in terms of uh, having him ready to go. But we'll get that squared away. We'll also have a lot of your comments on the uh, program here today there as well. So we'll do a lot of that coming up in just a moment with our buddy Mike Griffith. And it's uh, great to have all of you with us there as well. In fact, I may have a quick moment to squeeze in a couple of comments before we uh, do. So let's see if we can get that up and running before all of that gets going. I can't quite tell what's going on on the other side over there, but hopefully uh, we'll have all that good to go here in just a moment. All right, uh, over here on the uh, YouTube side of things, just for a moment, we'll take a few comments and uh, be ready to do this. Over here on the, uh, all right, YouTube on YouTube. Just Let's see what else is going on. A lot of talk about possible Big 12 expansion and kind of the job that Dan Lanning was almost a uh, factor for or was a factor for the opening there at Kansas. So a little bit of YouTube conversation about that right now. Um, Scott Harris said uh, he made a Saban admission yesterday. I'm curious to see what that was. Uh, DMAR42 says Kirby and Muschamp's friendship has to be weird for coaches, especially Lanning. I don't think it uh, will cause issues, but Lanning has to wonder uh, who he'll listen to more. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any kind of question about, you know, hierarchy and decision-making. And, and frankly, when it comes to those decisions on defense, I'm actually of the belief that's Dan Lanning's defense to run it the way that he wants to with influence from guys like Kirby Smart and, and you know, Muschamp there, there as well. But I don't think there's any, any confusion about hierarchy and leadership. I mean, you know, Lanning has been here now for a while, is paid the kind of salary that gives him – authority there you know it'd be one thing if he was making you know 400 grand or something like that and you know never discount that as one of the reasons why coaches make the salaries they make because it does give them some gravitas in those decision making you know moments in those you know leadership opportunities that Lanning can be looked at as a defensive coordinator and yes on the one hand you may somewhat say that hey you know as I alluded to before it may not be an ideal situation for him that Another guy potentially exists who could possibly get credit from, you know, media types. If Georgia has defensive success, that's true. 
But I think that Lanning also is, and I'm, he's not told me this, I'm just guessing on this. I think Lanning also probably has a nice sort of big picture appreciation on this too, that when when Kirby Smart brought Lanning onto the Georgia staff, their, um, you know, Lanning was a, for the most part kind of an unknown. I mean, I'll be the first to tell you, I didn't know anything about Dan Lanning when he was hired away from Memphis. That was not a guy that was really on my radar as an assistant coach. He wasn't, he, he at least wasn't famous to me. So the fact that, you know, Smart kind of tabbed him when he did, you know, brought him up very quickly becoming the defensive coordinator. You know, I, I'm sure that Lanning may say, well, it may be imperfect to have to share the spotlight with other defensive minds, but my gosh, look how quickly my career is progressing. Look how fast all of this is going. And I think from that standpoint, Dan Lanning's probably pretty happy with the way that his career is working out because I do believe sooner rather than later, he'll certainly have a chance to be a uh, head coach and the work that he does on the field for Georgia this season could go a long way towards making that happen. All right, I've gotten the thumbs up here. Sounds like our buddy Mike Griffith is ready to go. So we'll talk landing and everything else after a very revealing press conference yesterday. As we said before, it is a Georgia Farm Bureau practice report. It rolls on here on Dog Nation Daily and good to have all of you with us too. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Good to have Mike Griffiths with us here today, presented by Georgia Farm Bureau. A lot going on around the uh, Georgia program, and I want to make sure we talk about all of that. Mike, hope you're doing well, and if you don't mind, I want to begin our discussion with where uh, I was just a moment ago. I thought it was a really interesting press conference from Dan Lanning yesterday. I think Lanning's pretty good about talking about football when he meets with the media. I liked a lot of what he had to say. Obviously, I think he brings a lot of energy to these kinds of discussions there as well. What did you make of what you got from the Georgia defensive coordinator yesterday? Yeah, you know, I agree. I think Dan's a great defensive coordinator, and obviously, uh, you know, that's a position that it's a universal position. I mean, Dan makes the call in that room. And he comes up with a defense. Uh, Will's value is huge when you think about, Brandon, the reload that Georgia's had to do in that secondary. You know, seven guys uh, last year's secondary are gone. Two to transfer, Major Bones, Tyree Stevenson, and then five on the NFL. So it's really been timely for Will Muschamp to be on the Georgia staff as a defensive analyst. He worked with those defensive backs, and now – is a special teams coordinator. Again, another one of those universal positions. Everybody's involved, uh, but it's most chance it coordinates that. So, you know, I thought Dan talking about Will was, was good. I was enlightened by what he said about the offense and, and Darnell Washington and just, you know, you can have good coverage and you still can't stop this guy. Yeah, that's certainly very interesting. I want to talk to you more about the – the shift around with Muschamp and Scott Cochran being out, at least for now. I want to get to that with you in just a moment. Before that, though, let's do dive a little bit into what's been going on at UGA practice here over the course of the last couple of days. Obviously, those preparations are ongoing. What can you tell us about what's been unfolding and these uh, this you know readiness for a Clemson that looms large on September 4th? What can you tell us about Georgia practice right now? Well, I mean, Georgia's working on themselves first. I know that's boring, but it's so true. And with the Warren Erickson injury that the Dog Nation reported on Sunday night, uh, saw 24-7 came out the next day and said Erickson is expected to be out for a couple of weeks. Uh, that's big. I mean, it, you know, now it's next man up. It's Cedric Van Pran. I mean, that's the extent of how big it is. But Erickson is a trusted guy. And after what happened to JT Daniels at USC with the center exchanges, I mean, uh, you know, this is, this is nerve wracking for a quarterback. You have to get the snap. And we saw last year in the opener, uh, Trey Hill did a poor job early on. And that led to Arkansas, uh, you know, and, and Juan Mathis out of sorts. Arkansas led the game at halftime. So the center exchange is something that we take for granted. Uh, we really shouldn't. Even going back to the South Carolina game they lost, uh, largely there was some bad center exchanges. Trey Hill again. Uh, getting beat up pretty good by the dominant South Carolina defensive lineman, and it really just created all sorts of havoc. So first and foremost, I think Cedric Van Pran really needs to step to the front. Uh, he had a bad snap in the spring that resulted in a fumble that Jordan Davis returned for a touchdown in one of the scrimmages, or one of the closed scrimmages. Uh, you hope that Cedric Van Pran has come far enough along that if he is pressed into action, that's not an issue. Now we'll see where Warren Erickson is at. So that's that's the first thing. To me, that's, that, that jumps up above everything else, takes priority over everything else, uh, that center exchange. 
Yeah, no, I think that's right. I was actually going to get into the Erickson thing with you a little bit later on, but since you brought that up, I'll, I'll kind of go there as well. And, Mike, the one point that I've made about this a few times is I think there's been a little bit of a misunderstanding amongst some fans in the importance that Erickson potentially has. You described the importance of the center position overall. I totally agree with that. But in particular, when it comes to Erickson, this was a guy who, if you look at everything that was said and everything that was done during spring practice, including G-Day itself, this was a guy who was essentially treated as a – proven starter on you know or 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 a, or a surefire starter on this Georgia offensive line even though he had not started a full season yet at the center position you know you may have gone into the calendar year of 2021 saying Georgia had three offensive line positions that were open but by the time that spring practice was done I think the Georgia fan paying close attention would have said actually there may only be two offensive line positions that were done because certainly after G-Day I came away with thinking that yes Warren Erickson had clearly emerged and earned that starting spot at center which is not to disparage Cedric Von Prahn who I still think is an incredible prospect will get his chance to show what he's all about at some point in time but pretty clearly the Georgia coaches viewed Erickson as their top center otherwise he wouldn't have gotten the treatment during the spring that he got yeah you're right when, when Matt Luke held that press conference you know Warren Erickson was mentioned in the same breath with Jamari Salyer and Justin Schaefer that those were the three guys uh, and the word leadership came up. So I think your point is well taken. And, uh, you know, that's where it starts. Now, that said, uh, the run game has had some explosive runs I'm hearing. Uh, Zamir White, James Cook, Kendall Milton, Kenny McIntosh, all with some long runs. But, but Milton is the guy uh, who has really continued to emerge. He, he was the best back in the spring by all counts, and he's carried that into fall drills. Now, I don't know how that translates against Clemson, Brandon, because – you know, I don't. I don't think you uh, run to set up the pass against that Clemson front. I, I think you pass to set up the run. Yeah. And I still think James Cook is a guy that fits that scheme. But but what I'm hearing is those backs that have had their moments. Uh, the, the defensive line has dominated for the most part. But when the backs have gotten some space, uh, they've made plays. Also, hearing some good things uh, about Lad McConkey making some plays downfield. Uh, plan on doing a report on that today. Uh, a guy that's kind of taken advantage of some of some repetitions that he's getting, and then of course, you know, we heard Dan Lanning yesterday talk about Darnell Washington, and and how you can have great coverage on Darnell Washington, and it just doesn't matter. He's able to make the contested catch downfield a great catch radius for Darnell Washington. Will be an absolute weapon for the Bulldogs. Yeah, I think the Washington name is really interesting for me, and I've said it many times before that I think that Darnell had a better freshman season than I probably thought he was going to have. You know, obviously, th th this was a unique athlete coming out of Nevada when he signed with Georgia, but sometimes for guys like that, there's a little bit of a of a project that's ongoing, and that first season's more about, you know, developing and making sure you're in the right physical condition, but also making sure you understand what's going to be required of you at the college level, and I thought that Darnell might go through some of that last year. Frankly, I told my audience many times that I didn't have the highest level of expectations for Washington during his first year on campus, but the truth is, Mike, by the Missouri game and the Cincinnati game, you know, Darnell was playing better at the end of the year than I probably expected him to. So now maybe I'm guilty of going too far the other direction now in which I actually think given the mismatches he has a chance to exploit, I think that Darnell Washington is among Georgia's most dangerous pass-catching targets here this season. I, I guess I assume he'll, he's going to be in the top three, top four for Georgia in receiving yards just because I think the tight end position can be that valuable. I think Washington playing – you know, as a tight end gives him a chance to do some things that maybe a guy like Gilbert playing wide receiver, if he's playing there most of the time, may not quite get a chance to exploit quite as much. I hope I'm not too high on Washington now because I'm pretty high on Darnell all the way around, Mike. Yeah, I don't think you can be high enough on Darnell. I absolutely think he's a weapon. I think if you're a coordinator, I think you almost start with him. He's a problem. He's an absolute problem. You, you can't match up with him with one player. This is a guy – that you're going to have to do, you're going to have to put two guys on. You, now, now, how dangerous is he and how far downfield? I don't know. I don't know the scheme. I know Brock Bowers is a guy, though, that really impresses. I mean, they have two really good tight ends. And say this, I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't fault you for being too high on Darnell last year. Spring wiped out the acclimation period for Kendall Milton, for Darnell Washington, uh, for a lot of these freshmen. I mean, this is when they would typically – you know, go through those growing pains, but they had that taken away, and so we had to kind of watch those guys as the season progressed. Remember, Milton had the hamstring at the beginning of the year. 
Uh, and then just when he got rolling, he, he sprained the knee against Florida. He could have been a difference maker in that Florida game with more carries for all we know. Uh, this is a dynamic running back that we're talking about, a game changer, a type of game changing running back. So uh, I think a lot of those freshmen, particularly uh, Milton and Washington, are guys that really suffered because they didn't have the spring that I expect to have big years for Georgia. This is our Georgia Farm Bureau practice report. Their buddy Mike Griffith there in Athens. As I said before, it's brought to you by our friends at the Georgia Farm Bureau. I love what they're doing because they're providing support to all of Georgia's communities, whether it be special agricultural programs or big-time savings when it comes to your home, your auto, your life insurance. Those are a lot of things that Georgia Farm Bureau is able to do for you. You can find out a lot more about this by checking out gfbinsurance.com. That's the website, gfbinsurance.com. Georgia Farm Bureau is always the home team and Mike speaking of the home team let's keep the conversation going it was certainly an interesting development uh, over the course of the last couple of days when it comes to Scott Cochran the special teams coach being out for now we don't know how long his absence is going to last for what Kirby Smart's described some some mental health issues that have to be seen too obviously on this show we've extended well wishes and prayers to him that he gets the help that he needs and gains the perspective that he needs to gain I take that very very seriously but this is also a football show we talk about the football team and the curiosity about how this impacts the team is going to be top of mind for a lot of the folks who are listening and watching us right now insert Will Muschamp into his place I've got my thoughts on it but I want to hear yours first just big picture what do you think about the insertion of Muschamp here I don't think Georgia loses any momentum at all I think maybe recruiting you know there may be some relationships fractured uh, but in terms of on the field, I, I don't anticipate any change in momentum. I don't expect any drop-off. You know, remember, uh, Kirby hired Robbie Drushell, a guy that was a two-time national special teams coordinator of the year in February, and you have him at your disposal as, a, as an analyst. You know, he won those awards at Oklahoma State and Toledo. So, and, and that's a position that Kirby himself is involved in. So, you know, when you added Will Muschamp, uh, you know, that may turn out to be the move of the century. If Georgia wins the national championship, I think we might circle back to that addition and say, you know what, that was a great pivotal hire because Will's got it covered. I mean, this is a great football coach. You know, I, I know fans uh, look at his record at South Carolina or his side. But listen, that, that, that's dumb, okay? This is a great coach who's been a, a decorated coordinator. He's been in the game a long time. He's a Georgia Bulldog. He's a good friend of Kirby. He knows how to work on his staff. Um, this is just a phenomenal hire that's going to come up big now. And, and I, you know, just talking with players and hearing their reactions. You know, we do the show with uh, Kendall Milton and Kenny McIntosh on Sunday nights. And, you know, you can just hear the enthusiasm in their voice. There's a really good vibe over there uh, in Georgia right now. Yeah, I mean, what I've said about this is, that while it's good to have a guy like this step in if you need a special teams coach, the truth is, you know, I think there's probably a lot of people that can coach special teams, especially when you think about the talented young players that play on Georgia special teams, hungry for a chance to play more. To me, that's what fuels, you know, special team success anyway. Obviously, specialists kind of do their own thing, and Georgia's got seemingly a, a couple of good ones in those, and Pudlesny and obviously Kamara, the uh, punter. But when you unlock Muschamp to now do these other things. You know, Kirby Smart said before when George was playing South Carolina and Muschamp was the head coach that Will had actually kind of bounced around professionally enough at different places that defensive-minded-wise, he maybe wasn't as much of a of a carbon copy as the Kirby Smart defense, as some people might assume, given the fact their backgrounds were so similar. So possibly you have some new ideas now potentially inputted into this defense. And who knows, you know, how that can benefit you, especially week one against a team like Clemson, a guy that Muschamp has game-planned against many times before. I also think that Muschamp's an incredibly valuable asset on the recruiting trail. Now he can be an in-home visitor for you. He can go in-home. Jalen Walker mentioned Will Muschamp by name when he made his uh, you know, pledge to Georgia going back a couple of months ago. That What's exciting about this is, is that now that Muschamp is one of your on-field coaches, I think you unlock his potential in areas beyond special teams. Not to say that special teams not important, I think that it is, but I'm almost more interested in what Muschamp can now do for Georgia beyond special teams than I am just what he's able to do and tinker with when it comes to that phase of the game. Yeah, well, he's been working with the secondary, and, and obviously that's an area where he has expertise, and Georgia needs a lot of coaching. You know, Coach Dye is there, and Kirby's there, but again, when you lose seven players, uh, you know, you want a lot of eyes on those kids. You want to give them a lot of feedback, and you know, I'm, I'm hearing good things about Steve Ringo. You know, the thing that he was missing was field time. Dan Lanning pointed that out yesterday, and 
you know, I, I think Muschamp has a, a lot to do with, with a lot of things going on, but, but really, Brandon, all the coaches do. I mean, it's, you know, the way Kirby does it, everybody stays pretty involved, and, and there are different people that coordinate different departments, um, but, but I think it's very much a group effort. So, and, and Will has fit in well, and I think he's given Kirby a, a really nice sounding board, another coach you can kind of look in the eye that's been there and done it and, and uh, you know, call Kirby out. If, some, if someone needs to call Kirby out, Will's the guy to do it. Nobody else in that staff, I don't think, looking in the eye like Will can, um, and, and say, hey, you know, I, I don't know about that one, head coach. Uh, and I think Kirby appreciates that sort of feedback from an expert like Will Muschamp. All right, Mike, thanks for being here for a Georgia Farm Bureau practice report. A lot going on with the dogs there in Athens, getting ready to get going now with full pads and everything like that. So that's obviously a big step up in business. As Jim Ross would say, business really about to pick up now for these uh, dogs. So that's fun stuff to think about. And we will look forward to reading a bunch from you, dognation.com, and, of course, talking to you here back on our show again very soon there as well. All right, thanks, B.A. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. All right, interesting there when it comes to uh, Mike Griffith, everything going on there at UGA. Obviously, these practices are unfolding, as we said before. You know, this is around that time you start to put those pads on for real and you get there and start, you know, popping – a little bit more and obviously you know for guys who are trying to earn their way to actual playing time in the field this is when that competition really seems to get intense so a lot of ears to the ground a lot of folks trying to you know work the rumor mill to kind of find out what's going on and i'm right there with everybody else just very very curious about how all of this plays out as we get ready for the upcoming season really good stuff there got an sec through coming up before that though let me shout out my friends at the finish long drink and let me shout out some of you who have been kind enough to share your own experience with the finished long drink and giving it a shot because of what we've been saying here on this show. Really appreciate that in, in a huge way. Let me show you a couple of these on the screen here for a moment. First of all, our buddy uh, S Highland 23 on Twitter says, sitting there in North uh, California, enjoying a long drink and a cigar at my UGA dog fire pit, waiting for that golden shoe. Well, uh, definitely a little early in the show for golden shoe style, but uh, Mr. Highland, certainly we can give you some credit for that. Love to see the cigar working. Love to see the long drink strong, by the way, in the black can. That's 8.5% alcohol by volume. That looks like a great setup, and the fact that you're having so much fun right there certainly makes me feel pretty good there, too. So thank you to S. Highland 23 for that. Also, our buddy SilverDog5 on Twitter saying that he enjoyed his first long drink at the uh, Noonan Country Club, playing a little golf. Boy, that looks great. He says, I, I really like that cranberry. I'm going to be drinking a lot more. Hashtag go dogs. Hashtag the long drink. So I'm jealous of uh, both Silver Dog and uh, uh, Highland there for nice setup around the fire pit, nice setup at the golf course. It is good to see dog fans enjoying themselves as we get ready for the upcoming season. And of course, if you want to enjoy yourself much the same way, the finished long drink, great way to do that. There are four options. You saw a Highland there with the uh, long drink and the black can. That's 8.5% alcohol by volume. That's the long drink strong. You saw our buddy Silver Dog with the long drink cranberry. I like the uh, the uh, traditional that comes in the blue can. That's the citrus. That's the that's like a grapefruit with gin. There's also long drink zero there as well, which is kind of a really cool thing. From Finland in the 1950s, now in America, and really wherever you are, it's it, it's right there for you. So if you go to thelongdrink.com, you can find out more about this. Thelongdrink.com. You can find out more about where you can pick yourself some up today. I've been hearing nothing but good stuff about the folks who've been trying it as those personal testimonies do attest. Let me spend a little bit more time on the coaches poll just for a second. Look at the rest of the SEC here for a moment. I thought it was interesting that, as I told you before, Alabama is number one in the preseason coaches poll. And what's more interesting than that, Crimson Tide got 63 of the 65 first place votes. I believe the only, the only other team to earn a first-place vote was Oklahoma. They got the other two. So here's the point that I can make, and I said this this morning when I was on with my friends at 960 The Ref in Athens. I actually think that you can make a case against Alabama for the upcoming year. Like, the one thing I have a hard time doing is make a case for anybody else, and that's, by the way, Georgia included. You've heard me pick Georgia win the SEC East. You've heard me say, as I said off the top of this show today, that – this needs to be the kind of year where Georgia figures out some sort of path back to the college football playoff, either beat Clemson and be a second SEC team in the thing, or go out and do the really hard thing and take down Alabama in an SEC championship, that this needs to be a playoff year for Georgia. But you haven't heard me go so far as to say that Georgia's going to win the national championship. They certainly can. I just am, you know, I'm just not picking them outright to do that right now because there are still some unknowns to consider. But much the same way there are unknowns for Georgia, 
Ohio State's got a new quarterback. Uh, Clemson's making a lot of changes, new quarterback, new running back included. Oklahoma, you understand where some of that comes from from them. They were certainly hot at the end of last season, but how many times are you going to see them get absolutely walloped in the college football playoff before you say, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on me, or fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. You know, you look at Alabama with new offensive coordinator. I think it's going to be very hard for Bill O'Brien to replicate what Steve Sarkeesian has done. Mac Jones had a great season last year. Even a very highly rated recruit like Bryce Young, hard to replicate that success there as well. Uh, you can make a case that Alabama won't win the national championship. After all, they didn't win it in 2019. They didn't win it in 2018. Didn't win it in 2016. I mean, it's not as if Alabama wins the national championship every single season. You can make a case for them not winning the national championship. But as of now, who do you make the case for? Georgia is at number five, we said before. Interesting that Texas A&M comes in at number six. Now, some of y'all give me grief. You think I'm a Texas A&M apologist because I have talked up A&M for this upcoming season. Let me just say one thing, though, in relationship to Texas A&M and Georgia, why dog fans should be paying attention to the Aggies. And it's got nothing to do with the kind of cross-pollination of recruiting battles for guys like Bear Alexander and Deion Bowie and guys like that. Here's why I think that Georgia fans should be paying attention to Texas A&M. As I told you before, a potential path for the playoff for Georgia is to beat Clemson in week one, run the table the rest of the games, and maybe Georgia does what it did in 2018, which has come up just short in an SEC title game. That's the kind of resume that ought to get Georgia in the college football playoff, or at least give it very strong consideration for making the college football playoff. You know, being, what would that be, a, a 12 and yeah, 12 and 1, lost Alabama, win against Clemson, that ought to get you strong consideration for the college football playoff. Last year, we saw a conference championship game loser, Notre Dame, make the playoff. In 2017, we saw two SEC teams make the college football playoff. That might very well be enough to get Georgia in the discussion. But be very careful with Texas A&M. A&M could lose to Alabama. They host the game in College Station. But A&M could lose to Alabama. Here's the thing you got to be really, really mindful of. Is there an obvious loss anywhere else on the Texas A&M schedule? I don't know that there necessarily is. I'd favor A&M against LSU, against the rest of the SEC West. There really isn't that big non-conference game for Texas A&M this year, the way there has been you know, a few times against teams like Clemson, things like that. Now, you're going to tell me, well, B.A., if Georgia beats Clemson, they ought to make the playoff at 12-1 and over an A&M team that's 11-1. and That's a fair argument. But in terms of who Georgia might be competing with for a playoff spot, if it's a one-loss team with a very pretty resume other than that, look very closely at Texas A&M as one of those teams who was just on the outside of the playoff a year ago and may be in that same spot again here this year with maybe a little more attention paid to them. So that's why the dog fans should be watching A&M. If we're assuming this is the kind of year in which two SEC teams could make the college football playoff, then A&M, who Georgia does not play in the regular season, could end up being some of Georgia's competition for that. Very quickly, I'll say Florida is at 11. This is an okay place for Florida to start, I believe. Their final ranking is probably going to be lower than this, if I had to guess. But I am not one of these people that thinks that Florida finishes unranked this year. I think that the coaches putting Florida at 11 is a lot closer to where I think they should be ranked as opposed to some of the other media voices that have had the Gators unranked thus far. LSU is at 13. That's about where I think they'll finish. I think that's a pretty good team this year. As far as the teams that did not make uh, – Ole Miss came in at number 25. I don't believe that Ole Miss is a top 25 team. I've said that very, very clearly. I don't have to make that any more clear than that. As far as teams that uh, – did not make the top 25 that are on Georgia's schedule from the SEC. Auburn was fourth among teams f- receiving votes. Kentucky was 12th among teams receiving votes. Missouri uh, got eight total votes. Arkansas got three total votes. Uh, Mississippi State, who Georgia doesn't play, got two total votes. And, by the way, Georgia's Week 2 opponent, UAB, got three votes in the AP coaches poll. So just file that away and do with that what you will. But the Blazers, week two, coming into Athens, did get three votes in the preseason AC, a, a, uh, coaches poll. So pay a little bit of attention to that. We'll make that your SEC through. And here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort, I want to turn our attention to UG Recruiting here for a moment. And I want to go back in time to back in March when – Four-star linebacker Jalen Walker was being interviewed by Jeff Sintel, Dog Nation, on the heels of Walker's pledge to UGA. 
Walker was talking about some of those names that he was interested in bringing to Georgia with him. And one of the names that he brought up was someone from his home state of North Carolina, the five-star defensive tackle Travis Shaw. Let me give you a reminder of what Walker, a Georgia pledge and a good friend of Shaw, has said about the five-star defensive tackle in the past. Here is Jalen Walker. Is there anybody you're going to put the recruiter hat on and start working on now? Yeah, uh, one of the in-state guys here, Travis Shaw, you know, that's one of my good friends. We met uh, last summer, you know, ever since then, we've just been uh, great friends, you know, talking about everything, you know, going to uh, try to make visits with each other. But, you know, you know, my recruitment is in, in and kind of shorter than his, so I'm just going to keep working on him. So when you heard a guy like Walker say that, I think a lot of Georgia fans were left hopeful that, ooh, maybe in Georgia's pursuit of five-star defensive linemen, maybe the Walker presence in the 2022 class could be an edge for Shaw. It remains to be seen if that's exactly going to work out that way, but we are getting closer to finding out. Travis Shaw has put it out on Twitter that he's got a commitment date upcoming on August 21st. Now, I've seen a little bit of scuttlebutt back and forth about you know what this date means and what's going on with that, but you know, based on the fact that the school itself has also made an announcement about a, a ceremony at the same time, I, I guess we're going to treat this as the real commitment announcement for Travis Shaw set to take place there on August the 21st, and this is one of those honesty compels you admit type of things that it seems like a North Carolina or a Clemson may be ahead of Georgia in this recruitment right now. Maybe the in-state Tar Heels really are the leader in all of this. I guess you're left to wonder if it does play out that way on the 21st, is there a chance that Georgia can still be involved in this recruitment? I don't know that I would favor them for that decision right now, but we do have a date now on the board for Travis Shaw. It is later on this month, and we'll see how the dogs fare when it comes to all of that. So sometimes the news is not great, but you got to deliver it anyway. If I had to be honest, I'm not quite so sure George is trending in the right direction for Travis Shaw, but maybe somebody like Jeff Sintel will give us some new update on that later on that kind of changes a little bit of that. We'll follow that when it happens. Had a little technical difficulty on Monday show, many of you are aware, kind of putting a spoiler on what was our 1500th show, and I was pretty disappointed about that. As far as our golden shoe goes today, the official Ross on Twitter gives you a very funny uh, response to that. He says, I feel like this was Dog Nation Daily's level of anger during the streaming errors earlier this week and you see uh, Mr. Griffin the family guy character there with the technical difficulties and he's like pulling the antenna apart on the TV that is very funny from the official Ross and probably not too far off from how I was feeling on Monday and frankly when you compare me to Mr. Griffith maybe not too far off from how I look either all right so good stuff there from the official Ross you're our golden shoe winner for today Gatorator countdown nice even number 80 days from now we'll see you tomorrow dog nation daily presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort and on video. Time now for R.S. Andrews cool down. Great to have all of you with us for that. Of course, R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. One of the reasons why we love, love our friends at R.S. Andrews. They'll get that air conditioning unit for you. Tune back up to factory fresh specs, and it only costs $99. So make sure you check them out today. Uh, Grow Hawkins gives us an and on video, and I'm glad to be able to do that. Uh, Jesse Jones uh, having some fun in the comment section. Daniel Aldrich says he loves uh, uh, Peter uh, uh, for sure. Always funny stuff. Good to see Steve Schiaffini here today. I feel like we haven't seen, seen Steve in a while. Um, uh, Steve Schiaffini, very funny as always, though. Steve Hyland says the Texas A&M gets upset at Arkansas, loses at home to Bama and at LSU. Boy, if you really believe that, Steve, there's some places you can go to make some money on that because uh, our friends at BetUS have their over-under total at 9.5 right now. So if you've got them 9-3 and three in the regular season, you can cash a ticket on that. Um, I, I don't have them winning the SEC West, but I'd favor them against LSU. And I listen, I was high on Arkansas a year ago, but I can't do that right now. But I'm happy to hear your very bold prediction on that because it makes the comment section more fun. Uh, Alan Hampton says preseason polls and preseason player ratings mean nothing at all. They might get you in the ballpark and they make for some fodder, but I pay little attention to them. Great show. Go dogs. Appreciate that. Yeah. The, you know, and uh, for the kind words, Alan, I appreciate that, but that's kind of why I try to make the point I did off the top of the show that you can say that, you know, they're not perfect in their predictions, but in comparison to, as I said before, like official sec media predictions, things like that preseason coaches poll has actually gotten it pretty right. I mean, you know, preseason number one, making at least the playoff in each of the last five years, you know, that's probably more difficult to do than you, you know, maybe might think. Now, maybe a program like Alabama or Clemson makes that a little easier right now, 
But that's kind of the point is that is that, you know, that one spot, that two spot in these preseason rankings have been fairly bulletproof in terms of your ability to make the college football playoff. Let's see. Uh, Matt Rukavina says, don't forget Texas A&M is breaking a new quarterback and offensive lineman. That's tough to go 11-1 and one on. That may be true, but they're also playing teams that are breaking in new quarterbacks there as well. To use the teams that Steve mentioned before, Arkansas is a new starting quarterback. Uh, LSU will have a new full-season starting quarterback. Max Johnson wasn't the full-season starter for LSU a year ago. You know, a lot of the teams in the SEC West themselves are also breaking in new quarterbacks too. So that's not so much an argument against Texas A&M, just given the fact that they'll be in the same situation with teams that they're competing against. Let's see what else. Randy Hall says, how about a golden shot instead of a golden shoe, a golden shaw award? Randy's always very creative. I like that. I like that. That's that's actually very creative. Ooh, how about Daniel McKenzie coming hard with some hot takes, saying that Bama will lose two games, and this is the season we see a non-Power 5 team make the playoff. That is a very strong take. Cincinnati will obviously have its chance. It starts preseason uh, top 10, doesn't it? Did it wasn't the preseason top ten of the coaches poll? Um, hold on. And as we talked about, I think it was on yesterday's comment section that they got a big game at Notre Dame. So if you want to make a playoff case for Cincinnati, you know they got the the Notre Dame game in October that gives them a chance to kind of you know get that attention a little bit. Cincinnati starts at number ten, uh, just behind North Carolina and ahead of Florida, Oregon, LSU teams like that. So. You know, you could see, um, you know, when Michigan State made the playoff back in 2016, they started out lower than 10th. So you could see a number 10 team getting in. I, I sort of wonder if the committee wants to do that. You know, I think the, the committee would judge Cincinnati very harshly. But if they're undefeated, if they've got a win against Notre Dame on the road, it becomes a little harder to judge them quite so harshly if they're putting together the kind of resume that, that you know, other teams would would be somewhat envious of. It's not, I mean, a team like Clemson. If Clemson doesn't beat Georgia, Cincinnati would have a better regular season resume if it goes undefeated than Clemson would have, right? So, you know, when you do play the high-profile game in South Bend against the Irish, you have a chance to do that. As far as the Alabama thing with the two losses, you know, this is something I think that's really interesting, is that when Alabama's on top of the college football world, we kind of assume that it's impossible for them to ever get knocked off that perch. In fact, there are probably some people who hear you say Alabama – will lose two games, and they basically laugh at you saying, ah, yeah, good luck with that. That's an impossibility. But two seasons ago, in the regular season, Alabama did lose twice. I mean, yes, they win more often than not, and they win more national championships more often than not. I get all of that, but they are not completely bulletproof. In 2019, they had a two-loss regular season, so I don't think your prediction is necessarily all that outlandish, as I said before. It's easier to make a case for me against Alabama than it necessarily is to make a case for the one team most likely to unseat them, but clearly we hope that it's Georgia. Let's see what else. Uh, who? Somebody is it? Jermaine King's birthday today? Is that, is that who said it was his birthday? Uh, where is Jermaine? I, I can't find this. Reggie Walker's got Georgia, Bama, Oklahoma, and Ohio State in the college football playoff. Pretty good, uh, pretty good four right there, I'd say. Calvin Sanders says UNC, which starts preseason number nine in the coaches' poll, could potentially be the ACC champion, make the college football playoff. I'm a believer in Sam Howell. I think Howell in a one-game scenario, ACC title game against Clemson, assuming that's the matchup, could Howell win that game for the Tar Heels? I think he probably could. Um, and to think that the ACC title game might actually feature, you know, last year you had Clemson Notre Dame, but to think the ACC title game might actually feature a team on the other side capable of beating Clemson, which more often than not has not been the case, that'd be a, that'd be an improvement for all of us. Yeah, it is Jermaine King's birthday. He says he's not ashamed to self promote. You shouldn't be ashamed, Jermaine. Happy birthday to you, and thanks for being such a great part of our comment section each and every day. Epic Robinson's always very funny. Our buddy Epic Robinson is always very funny. Joseph Kennedy says, Vanderbilt, South Carolina, Florida, wish they could rent a quarterback. I've got my SEC country shirt on today. 
I think I'm going to do something on Dan Mullen related to quarterbacks today on SEC Country Live. Florida fans probably won't like it very much, but I've been thinking about something related to Mullen's recent history that I think has got to be identified. And we'll, we'll, we'll do that this afternoon, 3 p.m. Eastern time on SEC Country Live. And yes, Epic, our buddy Barry Barger will be back on the show, so you'll be happy about that. Susan Kornblut says uh, Alabama is in it every year. I do think there will be some questions because of Bryce Young starting at quarterback and the uh, loss of um, several key players. But I, uh, I just hope if Georgia ends up playing them this time, they beat them. Boy, I know you're right about that. I hope the same thing is true. And I almost wonder if the loss of Steve Sarkeesian is not more significant than the loss of Mac Jones. I just don't think you can put a price tag on what Sarkeesian did for Alabama last year from a play calling standpoint. I think it was that impressive. Joshua Campbell says Bama loses to Ole Miss. That game was close last year. I know Ole Miss has no defense, but can score. Yeah, offensively, it certainly put a lot of pressure on them a year ago. No doubt about that. Over here on YouTube for a few moments. Let's see what folks are saying. Let me scroll back to the end. Uh, Jay Shipes weighing in the conversation. Uh, Jim McLaughlin says Florida seems to be, uh, to believe in Emory Jones. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that there's a lot of I, – I, for me personally, based on the things that Dan Mullen was saying at the end of spring practice compared to the things that he's saying now, I feel like the conversation about Jones has actually shifted more to the positive than it was when Mullen was right at the end of spring practice. And sometimes that's just the way the conversation goes. But I feel like I've detected a little bit of a of a change in tone from Mullen. Either that's accidental or intentional, but we'll find out. John Hendricks takes his birthday there, too. John, that's awesome. Happy birthday to you. Worm gives us a go, dogs. Frank Patterson says, all I want for my birthday on the 27th is for B.A. to say on air that Bama can't produce a back that gains over 4,000 yards, much less two. See, I, I, I was going to wait and say that when it was your birthday, uh, but you'll have to pretend that I didn't when we get there for that. Uh, DGD Podcast says ACC title game will be UNC Clemson. Very well could be. It'll be, actually be a pretty fun game if that's the case. And for Clemson, it could be a much-needed resume-building game if they can get that win, especially if they were to lose to Georgia, which we all hope they do. If they were to lose to Georgia, you know, they need another good game on their schedule. Right now they don't have one. John Hendricks says, do you see any particular recruits that Muschamp can be an asset when recruiting? That's a really good question as far as the specific names. I'll probably have to defer for that to uh, Jeff Sintel, but I think there will be some. You know, the one that I commonly mention is the impact Muschamp seemed to have on Jalen Walker, and I think there will be more, but we'll have to probably ask Jeff Sintel specifically who those guys will be. DMART42 says, do we have any idea who the Texas quarterback is going to be? Very possible for Arkansas to beat them. Yeah, I mean, I've had Arkansas circled as an upset-type team against Texas for a long time. This is well before we knew that Texas was going to become to the SEC. I have just viewed Arkansas as a potential upset team that day. Now, Arkansas is trying to figure out its own quarterback situation. Looks like K.J. Jefferson, a former four-star recruit, is going to be that guy. This was a guy who threw three touchdowns when he had a chance to start the Missouri game a year ago. Didn't have a great completion percentage, but did throw some touchdown passes. That's a guy who's going to likely be the starting quarterback for Arkansas, and around him is a lot of experience. They lost Mike Woods, the receiver who transferred to Oklahoma, but, man, there's a lot of experience left in that, that Arkansas roster, one of the more experienced teams returning for the SEC. Georgia fans should keep that in mind when the Hawks come to Athens later on this season. But, yeah, if you like the idea of fun upsets to pick in Fayetteville, you know the stadium's going to be rocking that day because they hate, hate, hate Texas and Arkansas. That'll be a fun game. And I don't think you're off the target at all by saying certainly a potential upset. SWV33 says, a bold prediction, Florida loses four, maybe five games. Look at their schedule. It is tougher than we've seen the Gators play in the past. That's probably more losses than I'd give them, but I think you can at least give them three, LSU, Alabama, and Georgia. I'll give them those three right away. And, you know, I, it's, it's you know, can they then run the table in the other games they play? That's a very interesting take for sure. Scott Harris says, imagine the SEC chance of Arkansas beats Texas. Yeah, that'll be fun for sure. That'll be really fun. 
Jimmy Huff says, I like what I'm hearing from the coaches and players on team chemistry and desire to work together and for each other. I think we get over the hump and beat Bama this year. Go dogs. Yeah, Jimmy, I'm kind of with you on that. And I think you and I would both acknowledge that saying the right thing is easier than doing the right thing. Totally agree with that. But saying the right thing is the first step in that direction. And with that in mind, I think I will join you in saying I've liked what I heard from Landing yesterday and what I heard from Kirby Smart, the Georgia players on Friday. The players themselves are very careful not to say much, but you know Kirby himself was slightly more revealing, and we played some of that audio for yesterday. I thought it was really very good. Johnny Lester says the Gators won't beat any ranked opponents this season. Uh, yeah, maybe not. They may not get a chance to do that unless a team like Kentucky or Missouri slips into the top 25 and Florida gets a chance to beat them while they are ranked. That may be their best shot. Cody, the Cody Ledoux checking in. Always like to see him in the comment section. Q Lee thinks the Ole Miss is a dark horse. A lot of people do. I'm not really one of those, but we've heard that from some people. Raymond Felton says he'd rather Travis Shaw go to North Carolina than go to Alabama or Clemson. I kind of understand where you're going, coming from on that, Raymond. I, I, I sort of get that myself. Paul Moon says if we take care of business on the field, recruiting will take care of itself there too. Paul, I think you're right about that. A couple more on Facebook, then a couple more on YouTube, then we're going to go. George Ann Olive says I saw Texas play Arkansas when I lived in Austin. Lots of people wearing pig cats at that game. Yeah, it's really a great rivalry. It's one of the reasons why, you know, even though there's going to be a heavy southwestern flair to it, you know, Arkansas, A&M, Texas, all being back in the same conference again. Oklahoma, who has been in the same conference as Texas and Texas A&M before, kind of being a part of that four-team cluster there too. Those four teams could really despise each other, and they, they do really despise each other and could really create for some great games. And if you think about the potential of SEC pods, is there a pod that would be made – that would be better on paper than what A&M, Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas would be. Even if you say Texas is an underachieving team, they're still top 25 more often than not. Arkansas is the one kind of weaker link in that chain. But, you know, it wasn't that long ago they were producing winning seasons with regularity. And, you know, Oklahoma and Texas A&M are playoff contenders right now. So I, I sort of wonder if that would be the deepest of the 14 pods, if that's the direction the SEC goes. Shelton Tucker checking out. Good to have you here. Thanks so much for that. Oh, Yakoba Simba says uh, her daughter, is it, is it Sana? Am I pronouncing that uh, correctly? Yakoba, I want to make sure I pronounce that correctly. Is, is it Sana? Um, I really appreciate Yakoba. Uh, Y'all listening to the show. That means the world to me. Thank you so much for that. And if I mispronounce the name, give me the heads up and I'll make sure I pronounce it correctly because I want to make sure that I do. Because, um, listen, I love the idea of. Uh, folks getting together with the family and watching the show so that's that's an awesome thing so i'll check in on your pronunciation correction on me if i didn't quite get that right because really appreciate y'all watching and listening to the show for sure um let's see what else right quick before we go <laughs> have we seen Sh has shelton been gone from the comment section for a while because I feel like I see people giving him grief again the way we were kind of doing that back in the springtime. I don't know if Shelton's just kind of calmed down or if uh, or if uh, he's back here for the first time in a while. Ed Houston says that Dan Mullen's still a creepy guy. Uh, yeah, I kind of agree with you on that. Michael Campbell checks in to warn folks that Notre Dame's got a new offense. You expect more than 40 points a game. So uh, Michael fired up by the Irish here this year. Uh, Jordan Bowman talking about a Disney movie. I'm not even sure what that's even about, but always fun to hear him checking in. Jim McLaughlin, the Ole Miss defense. Yeah, I mean, you got to play some defense, and that's not really something they, they do, you know, a whole lot of. All right, uh, we're going to get ready to go here. Really appreciate all of you and great comments. Thanks for being here for the R.S. Andrews Podcast Cool Down. Y'all also make sure you check out the AJC online at AJC.com for the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. Big updates and everything going on around the city of Atlanta. Braves, nice win last night against Cincinnati as they try to hang on, right? You know, the implosion of the Mets, the, the Braves now have a stretch against winnable competition to try to make some sort of run here in the National League East. So fun to kind of follow that as thus far the, the folks who've, you know, come over and trade deadline type deals – have really stepped up for the Braves in a pretty good way. Hawks are also in their summer league right now. 
played uh, yesterday. I think it was yesterday afternoon in the Vegas Summer League. So a little bit of a look at what those those young Hawks uh, recently acquired in the draft kind of bring to the table. That's a good thing to be able to see. Falcons have training camp ongoing right now too. Uh, y- y'all try to hold your laughter when I tell you this. But there's a little bit of buzz about Felipe Franks working in Falcons training camp right now. So uh, make sure you check that out. Also, um, I, you know, the, the COVID stuff is obviously still going on in a big way, and that's obviously a little bit of a dark cloud over all the fun we're hoping to have this fall. But it is important to stay up to date on that. Make sure you do just that. And, um, yeah, I mean, there's some serious stuff going on. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm hearing personal stories again of, of people being negatively impacted by this. Didn't hear a lot of those for a while. Heard a bunch of them at the end of last year and, you know, went most of 2021 without hearing a lot of that. And You're hearing, you know, that kind of stuff again now, and it's tragic. It's terrible. So hopefully we'll do the right thing. Hopefully we'll get folks healthy and we'll be able to enjoy everything we have in store upcoming. But, you know, it, it is important to pay attention to what's happening right now because, unfortunately, a lot of stuff is. So that is very real. Atlanta Journal, Constitution, AJC.com. You can learn more about that. Thanks for being here for Dog Nation Daily, presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort today. Check out RS Andrews online, rsandrews.com. We will see all of you back here again tomorrow.